this morning. So, so I'll just uh, go ahead and say that this recording, this uh, meeting is being recorded. So I just went ahead and started that recording. Go ahead, Rafe. Thanks, Brianna. Uh, and again, good morning, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join us for this um, climate pollution reduction grant um, discussion that we're going to be having. Uh, my name is Rafe Porter. I'm the program manager of the Transportation and Climate Change Division here at the Air District, who is leading this effort. Um, and I'm going to kick it over to Brianna. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianna Moland, and welcome to today's webinar. This is the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants Program webinar hosted by the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. So like we said, my name is Brianna Moland. I'm a climate coordinator with the Transportation and Climate Change Division. We also have Ray Porter, who's our program manager with the Transportation and Climate Change Division, and we will be today's speakers. So just a little bit about housekeeping. Microphones are automatically muted for all invitees. Please enter your questions in the chat box and direct them to Paul Philly. Um, these questions will be answered during the Q&A session. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the CPRG website along with the presentation slides. So the next couple of slides are giving us an overview of the Climate Pollution Reduction Grants Program. So under the Inflation Reduction Act, EPA is providing grants for climate plans that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, support workforce development, and provide co-benefits to communities, especially disadvantaged communities. So the program goals include reducing climate pollution, including toxic air, pollution and criteria air pollutants, addressing environmental injustice from disproportionate pollution exposure, and creating green jobs. So this grant program is divided into two phases. So the first phase is for planning grants to develop climate pollution reduction strategies. These are non-competitive cooperative agreements, and there's $250 million available for states, cities, local agencies, and tribes. Then there's a phase two for implementation grants to help put the plans from phase one into action. And these are competitive grants with $4.6 billion available for two competitions, a general competition and a competition for tribes and territories only. Individual grants will range between $2 million and $500 million. And the grant application period is from September to April 2024. So EPA announced that phase one planning grants are being awarded to 46 states, including California, 79 large metropolitan statistical areas, four territories, and more than 75 tribes. So the Sacramento Metropolitan Statistical Area is one of the 79 large metro areas and one of the two air districts in California to receive planning grant funding. So the Sac Metro Air District is the lead agency for the Sacramento Metropolitan Statistical Area which is shown on the right-hand side of your screen. So we have El Dorado, Sacramento, Yolo, Sutter, Yuba, Nevada, and Placer counties all included in this MSA. And Sac Metro Air District is in active discussion with other CPRG lead agencies in California to ensure a coordinated approach. We're working with CARB and other MSAs like San Francisco Metro Area and California Air Resources Board or CARB is leading the state of California's planning grant and the Bay Area Air Quality Management District is the lead agency for the San Francisco MSA. Hey, Brianna, can I can I yes. um, stop you for just one second? Um, yes. We, we, we had a comment that, um, and I think maybe the screen might be a little hard to see because you're in presenter mode. So I think under display settings, there may be a either a full screen oh. mode because the, the slides are okay. showing up very small. Let's see here. Mm. Maybe on the top under display settings. Let's see. Maybe it only shows on our screens, but you know, <laughs> slides are are very small on on our screens. Let's see. Oops. Let me stop sharing for a moment. See if I can reshare. Ah, uh, much better. Thank you. Same, same thing. Nope, that's much better. That's perfect. Oh. Thanks. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So here is a list of our steering committee, and so we have SACOG, SMUD, SACRT, 
as well as the counties and cities within our MSA as participants. And we have um, 20 letters of support from this group. And those letters of support were submitted to EPA as part of our notice of intent to participate in this grant program. And so here we have all of the planning grant deliverables that are due as part of this grant um, program. So the first is our priority climate action plan, which is due March 1st, 2024, which includes a greenhouse gas inventory, greenhouse gas measures that reduce emissions, um, a low income disadvantaged communities benefits analysis, as well as stakeholder engagement. So in between the first and second deliverable, applicants would need to submit their phase two implementation grant applications using measures in the PCAP in 2024. So that PCAP is the necessary document for the phase two implementation grants. And after the PCAP and after the phase two implementation grant period is over, there is a comprehensive climate action plan due as the second deliverable, and that's due in 2025. And it includes a greenhouse gas um, emissions projections, greenhouse gas reduction targets, benefits analysis, as well as workforce planning analysis. So lastly, there's a status report, which is due in 2027, and it's a status update of greenhouse gas reduction measures, status of benefits analysis, and then updated funding opportunities analysis, as well as next steps. So here we can see the priority climate action plan schedule. So on the left-hand side, we have each program element, as well as the time frame, the activity, and the key milestone. And so the steering committee that we've put together for stakeholder coordination and engagement has been meeting on a monthly basis. Um, we also have community engagement with priority communities and stakeholders taking place in September, between September and October of this year. And key milestones will be an outreach advisory committee formed, community engagement strategy developed, and then we're going to recruit community engagement and technical contractors between June and August. We'll have a regional greenhouse gas inventory developed between June and September with a final report, methods, inputs, and results. Then we'll have a priority greenhouse gas reduction measure selection in, in collaboration with the steering committee between June and December. We'll have a health benefit quantification of the selected greenhouse gas reduction measures um, in September and November. And those low income and disadvantaged and other priority communities will be identified during that time frame. We'll have an identification of the steps necessary to get authority to implement the selected measures between October and November. And then we'll be aligning incentive projects and programs with priority CPRG projects. And we'll leverage local funding assessments as part of the funding opportunity analysis in October. And finally, we'll have a draft PCAP with internal partner and legal review between December and February with the final PCAP being released in February. And that will be posted to our website. So community engagement is very critical for this grant program. We'll be building on previous community outreach and data gathering that was conducted during the climate action plan development and help partners scale and implement measures in a manner that addresses community needs. And uh, engagement planning will be between August, July and August. We'll form the outreach advisory committee. We'll develop an outreach strategy and identify low income and disadvantaged communities. And community engagement will occur between September and October with SAC Metro Air District staff, partners, and Civic Spark Fellows. And additional outreach in low-income and disadvantaged communities will also take place. And during our partners' climate action plan development process, partners use CalEnviroScreen and other tools like SMUD Sustainable Communities Map to identify communities and gather input and data directly from them. We will go out into these communities during social gatherings and other community events to reach communities that do not typically participate in climate, planning, in climate planning work to get their feedback and input. So next, we want to hear from you all. So I'll turn it over to Rafe Porter, who will lead our question and answer period. And you can direct your comments and questions to Paul Philly in the chat box. And I'll also provide a link to our CPRG website in the chat. Thanks, Brianna. So yeah, mm -hmm. if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, and Paul will direct them to us. We'll give it a few minutes while you let it all marinate and sink in.
Brianna, it looks like you did such a great job of uh, explaining everything. <laughs> Okay, so we have our first question from Adrian Wren. Uh, confirming that this planning grant focuses on greenhouse gases and not criteria pollutants like particulate matter and lead. Uh, how, how, what is the interplay between criteria and um, greenhouse gases? Brianna, did you want me to go ahead and take that? Go ahead. So good, good question, Adrian. Um, we will be doing... Uh, we will be looking at other things outside of, of um, uh, GHG analysis. Um, we will be looking at, at not only from a co-benefits standpoint, but also what are the other um, uh, air quality, uh, either benefits of the mitigation measures or impacts from, from certain um, practices. Um, it probably won't be to the same extent um, as we're looking at the GHG and, and climate impacts, but it is going to be something that we will have a lens on for sure. I can't, I can't give you a specific um, uh, uh, answer on exactly uh, which measures and, and what policies we're gonna be looking at, but it is something that we're going to be considering. And the fact that this is playing into some of our other statewide tools, it's, it is going to be something that we factor into that as well. Yeah, we'll definitely be looking at criteria air pollutants during the benefits analysis piece of this work. All right. Our second question comes from Karen Huss. How does this program complement local government climate action plans? So um, the fact that we're working very closely with uh, our local cities and counties um, on this project, we are going to be bringing in um, the policies in adopted climate action plans and looking at those and um, uh, and quantifying the impacts uh, and the, mit the mitigation impacts from that and the benefits um, from measures that are in local climate action plans. Um, I think some of the work that's going to be coming out of um, both the inventory that we're doing first and then the measures later on are going to be able to um, either complement uh, those existing climate action plans or potentially, you know, um, be some of the the upfront work for jurisdictions that have not adopted uh, local climate action plans. Um, and you know, we'll obviously uh, continue to work with the cities and counties throughout this process. So um, if if things come up, um, we can address it uh, a little bit more ad hoc. But the plan is, uh, we've already started this process to to get all those measures and make sure that that. Um, we have have them for this priority climate action plan and that they are things that we can quantify on the back end. So it should uh, dovetail very nicely with, with um, what's already on the ground. All right. Um, Adrian had another question about commitments. Uh, what commitments have been made by jurisdictions, such as cities and counties, beyond the steering committee participation? Um, Brianna, I'm going to actually kick this one over to you. I don't know what else um, we've done with the city and counties. Thus well, far. Adrian, can you give us an example of the type of commitments you're wondering about? And I see some messages coming directly to me. Um, if you, and, and apologies, I'm not able to keep up with those. All questions need to be um, addressed to, um, directly to Paul Philly. Um, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation. So um, for all of those that have, have sent things to me, can you please resend those to Paul so that we can um, keep track of those, um, not only um, answer them in this webinar, but we um, will be able to have them on our website and an FAQ later. Thank you. Um, Adrian's talking about uh, steps beyond uh, steering committee participation. Uh, I think I can take a stab at this. One thing is that our steering committee is, I think, very interested in implementing measures in the plan, and they're going to be the ones who have to do the applications for phase two. So if nothing else, um, by participating and putting measures into the plan, it's likely that they are setting themselves up for a grant application to get the implementation grant. Um, and then there's also general commitments that we've had to share information and the work to see what is going to be attempted for implementation, what are the priorities of the community, uh, working with us to help identify um, disadvantaged communities and low-income communities. So there, it, it's not just sort of you send a staffer once a month. Um, 
I think Brianna can verify that we, we've seen a lot of work being done by our steering committee to make sure that this plan is appropriate and make sure that they can set themselves up for a competitive application uh, next year. And then we have uh, Tran wants to know, uh, do you think anyone receiving these grants would trigger CEQA? Uh, um receiving the implementation grants um absolutely i think those would um all be potentially sequa uh type projects um paul and brianna probably have a better understanding i i don't know that on the pcap specifically that it's going to require sequa but i think any of the implementation grants right. that are received in phase two would correct um planning grant uh does not trigger sequa but if you try to do stuff in the planning grants and make it real then there would be a CEQA document unless it falls under one of the various exemptions um, to CEQA. And then Ralph wants to know, how will the AQMD reach out to community groups and other environmentals? Yeah, so I mean, that that work has, has started already. Um, we're going to continue to work with, with um, our advisory groups. Um, we will be putting together other, as, as Brianna mentioned, the um, outreach advisory group as well. Um, we would, you know, obviously welcome participation in, in that process as well. Um, and then throughout the throughout the entire plan, there's going to be um, outreach. So it's really going to be up to that um, outreach advisory committee on on how best to uh, do that and, and who exactly uh, to target on that. So um, stay tuned for uh, for opportunities to be engaged in that process. Uh, Susan asks, uh, mentions that this is great, but uh, how did you reach out to partners and steering committee members to make them want to participate? And how do you and the partners anticipate this will affect the caps by the jurisdictions? Yeah, um, kind of, you know, very similar um, answers as before. Uh, you know, I think reaching out to to the uh, jurisdictions and, and letting them know about the, this opportunity, not only through the work of the PCAP and, this, and the, the comprehensive plan, but the phase two implementation dollars and that being engaged in this early planning phase does allow the opportunity to apply for some of those um, implementation dollars. I think um, was, a, was a good incentive to be engaged uh, in this process. Um, we really, we, we had a series of meetings, um, a lot of them in person with these jurisdictions to let them know about this opportunity. Um, and then that's going to then roll into, as I've already stated, the outreach um, advisory committee, then will then, you know, do probably something very similar of, of reaching out to, to um, various nonprofits and community-based organizations to get their, um, to get their involvement uh, in that process. And then the impact on the cap, as I already mentioned, um, <clears throat> most of the measures that are coming into this um, are from those locally adopted climate action plans. And so we will be doing the quantification of those measures, which I think would be beneficial at that local level. Um, and then obviously, the um, set, again, setting them up for the implementation dollars. For those that don't have climate action plans, I do think that a lot of the work, again, on the inventory and some of these measures um, could be something that they could look to to, to start their own um, climate action planning process. So Mike has a question about funding, um, and I, I don't think the guidelines are out yet, but I'll let Brianna answer. Um, but what kind of eligible types of projects do we anticipate being competitive? Uh, for example, zero emission buses and charging infrastructure. Would that be eligible? Would that be competitive? Yeah, we don't have the answer to that yet since EPA has not released guidance for the phase two implementation dollars, but we do know that disadvantaged communities and Justice 40 is going to play a role. So as long as you're able to demonstrate benefits to disadvantaged and lower income communities, um, you're part of the way there. All right. Uh, Katie with Local Environmental Justice Group 350 Sacramento uh, believes that they can offer some resources and wants to know if there's room for reciprocal relationships to be made between local nonprofits like SAC 350 and uh, what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Absolutely, Katie. Um, we should uh, find some time to, to chat offline a little bit more on what those some of those opportunities are. 
And as we put together this outreach advisory committee, I think you know getting involvement um, from folks like yourself um, can be extremely beneficial. Uh, and then obviously what comes out on the back end is not 100% uh, known at this point, but I think um, as we start to move more into that um, finalizing the, the priority climate action plan and definitely into the implementation phase. That's when it'd be great to get um, a little bit more assistance from, from folks like yourself on how do we um, not only position our region to be com more competitive for those funds, but actually move into the impl implementation of them as well. So Oscar has a question about one of the elements in the roadmap, uh, specifically identification of steps needed to get authority to implement measures. Uh, does this go beyond existing local authority? And if so, what might be needed? Brandon, do you want to bring that slide up? Yeah. Right here. So I'm sorry, Paul, can you repeat the question again? Sure. Um, basically, are we just looking at local authority to implement or what's what's needed to as as far as this element? I, I think Oscar just wants it fleshed out a little bit more. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. Brianna, are you able to take a stab at that one? Yeah, so in some cases, there are existing ordinances that are already in place to help implement some of these measures. In other cases, you will need to maybe go to city council and get um, approval for a new ordinance for something like um, urban heat island mitigation, um, parking lot shade uh, infrastructure. So yeah, in some, some cases there are steps that will be needed um, to get authority to implement some of the measures that we include in the priority climate action plan. Yeah, I think that answers a, the question. I think a good example is recently uh, there's a ninth circuit federal ruling on uh, California Restaurant Association v. City of Berkeley, um, which struck down on local natural gas bans. Um, and that was a big part of a lot of decarbonization of buildings. So having to rethink about do local jurisdictions have the authority to do that, or do we have to go at building decarbonization a different way? Um, that's one of the things that the plan will be looking at to make sure that there is the ability to make these things happen. Uh, Ralph wants to know who is on the outreach advisory committee. Uh, I, we, we haven't actually um, put anyone on that committee yet. I think we're starting that process about right now to start that work in, in August. Is that fair, Brianna? Correct. No. Okay, uh, Adrian wants to know about our subcontracting process. Uh, who do we have for research and evaluation? So we've got a, a few contractors um, already uh, uh, underway and a few that were uh, in the process of, of getting under contract. Um, we did have a competitive bid for um, for the, for the uh, contractor that's going to be doing the inventory analysis, um, it's someone that we've um, luckily worked with in the past, but we did go through a pretty rigorous selection process um, for that. Uh, and then some of the other work that's going to be tying into the, to the modeling and the tool development that we're going to be doing, um, we're working with uh, CAPCOA, which is the California Air Pollution Control Officers Association. Um, and specifically working in the Cali mod tool and the GHG quantification um, handbook that we've worked with CAPCO on. And they've um, done a selection process for a contractor through that um, process as well. So a lot of these things were, were done um, uh, related to some work that we've uh, already, already contracted and, and already had underway. So it did make some of the contracting a little bit easier. Um, but it was a pretty um, intense and, and rigorous process to select the, the vendors that we have. Hopefully, Adrian, that answers your question. I think Adrian noticed that this is a very fast timeline. Uh, how's that sort of impacting our ability to get a seven county regional priority climate action plan done in less than nine months? Yeah, with all of we, these elements. We, we asked EPA the exact same uh, <laughs> same questions I think every, everyone else did. Um, and so luckily, we again, we um, we were able to, to move pretty quickly on on securing those based on some um, 
processes we've we had done in the past. And and then again, working with Catcoa. So I think that covers all the questions that I see. If I missed your question, please resend it. Uh, or if you have any more, please go ahead and put it into the chat. All right. Um, well, uh, you do have our contact information if you do have any follow up um, questions or comments that you would like to make. Um, and we will be, uh, it seems like there's a lot of interest in that uh, uh, outreach advisory committee. So we'll be, um, um, you'll be seeing some information on that relatively soon. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for taking the time today and bringing your great questions. Brianna, I don't know if you had any other um, closing thoughts or, or comments that you would like to make. So we'll be posting this presentation um, on our CPRG website, which I did post to the chat. And I can put that link there again, just in case it was missed by someone. All right, thank you again, everyone, for uh, taking, taking the time. Um, we'll get this posted as soon as we can. Um, thank you again, take care. Thank you all.